Perhaps one of the most powerful individuals uh, on the face of this earth is a mother. Where there's greatness, there's a mother that made it. Rabi'atul Ra'i, he was one of the big scholars of Islam, but his father was in the army of the son of Uthman ibn Affan. He went towards our areas, Khurasan. And there he lasted for many, many years. And by the time he came back, young, young uh, Rabi', you know, would have been grown into a man. But before he left, he gave the mother 30,000 coins. He is this, look after yourself till I come back. For our sons, a long way off. When he came back, as is the sunnah, he went to the masjid first. And in the masjid he saw, there's a young man sitting in a huge multitude around him. He is one of the seven fuqaha of, of Medina. So feelings like, what a man, what an achievement. He came home and talking to the wife, he goes, what did you do with the 30,000? So she said, go to the masjid, you will see your son. So he went to see subhanallah and he said, you spent it well. You see, the one that made that ordinary Rabi into one of the giant of the scholars was the wisdom and the thought and the planning and the strategy and the vision and the outlook of that awesome woman who could have gone and bought shoes but instead she bought an education and a life for um, us to look, look up to till Qiyamah come. The famous man Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala they say uh, the young man wanted to be a singer and Malik's father is paralyzed. He was very limited so he used to make arrows that was his way of living. So young Malik told his mom, I, I want to be a singer because singers were looked after and you know, there, there was pomp and ceremony around them. So this, this intelligent, intelligent, intelligent creature, the, this, this mother of Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, tells him, says, uh, Malik, uh, singers are good looking. And this is to just sow doubt in his head, although Imam Malik is very good looking. And their career only lasts whilst they're young and good looking. And instead, she directed his attention towards ilm. You know how she went and bought him clothing of the ulama. And she used to wash him and perfume him and sit him up and then ask him questions on the sufra. Uh, Malik, how many raka'ah is in zuhr? So Imalik used to feel like a scholar and say four. She changed his projectile towards ilm. And, and understand this Muslims. You don't need money to create greatness. You don't need resources to create. It is the capacity of the mother and the capacity of a teacher that builds greatness. So interest sparked in the heart of Malik and then the rest became just mechanics so one of his famous sheikhs is Nafi' Mawla Ibn Umar you know the student of Ibn Umar and the, the freed slave of Ibn Umar and this is called the golden chain of narration and hadith for those who, who, who study hadith the, Imam al-Shafi'i from Imam Malik, from Nafi', from Ibn Umar, from the Prophet of Allah, they call this the golden chain. Nafi' was a strict man. He, you know, he didn't have time for people all the time. Sheikh, can I ask questions? You know, time wasting. Nafi', rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiyallahu anh, used to go to the mosque at a specific time. His dars was from this time to this time. If you have questions, ask them. Once I'm home, you do not intervene and interfere. I have to do my research and my study. So Malik knew, that, knew this and is sitting in a gathering with his huge scholars. He wouldn't ever get a chance to ask. So look at the ingenuity of the man, a product of the thirst for knowledge that the mom has instilled in him. He used to go and wait outside the house of Nafi'ah. And then he used to walk with him to the mosque.
just pretending this is coincidental. And when they used to take their shoes off at the door, Malik used to take his shoes off and look at the Sheikh and say, Assalamu alaikum. And then they used to enter. After the dars and the salah used to finish, you know, because Sheikh, my shoes is next to your shoe. I'm not stalking you, you know, this is coincidence. He used to walk back with him. And now they had acquaintance, they knew each other. So he used to say, Sheikh, what about this hadith and what about this hadith? And Malik became Imam Malik at the hands of this lady. Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. Go search history. He was, some scholars say, when he was in the womb of his mom, the father passed away. Some say a couple of months after his birth, the father passed away. Who made Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i Imam al-Shafi'i? And what did she have? Financially, she was very poor. But she designed the whole curriculum of this young lad more than any scholar of our time could. She took him to Mecca. Go learn the Quran now. She sent him to this Rabi'at al-Ra'i. Go learn his manners before you learn the deen from him. He became a hafiz, started to study hadith. Then she said, you need language, so go to the desert near Mecca and go and stay for years with the Arab tribe so that your language, you become master of the language. Go to Imam Malik in Medina and study the Muwatta. And Shafi'i Imam, you know, became as Imam al-Shafi'i at the hands of this woman. My sisters, you make or break the future generation. And you brothers have a responsibility to build and educate and honor and respect and make mothers and sisters who have the capacity to bring about greatness or you can keep them, you know, the backward and educated, immaterial and mattered individuals who will bring generation after generation of failures. Look at the Quran. Because you will say, Ustaz, what is Dalil for this? When the mother was good, look at Ismail alayhi salam. Single mother brought him up in the desert. From a father who left him there since young and came back at all, you know, when he had reached manhood. Had she been a poor mother, a weak mother, and, you know, an unfaithful mother, she would have poisoned his head with, where was he for your second birthday? Where, why didn't he buy you this? Why didn't he come for your celebration? He was, didn't even give me a Valentine's gift. Instead, when he comes years later, a prophet of God, seeing Ismail alayhi salam, he utters this proposition. My son, I have seen in a dream, anni azbahuk, fandur madha tara. Then see what is your opinion. And the upbringing of a righteous mother is this. Oh my father, do as you have been commanded. You will find me by the grace of Allah, of those who will bear it patiently. That is an upbringing of a righteous mother, of an intelligent mother, of a far-sighted mother. And when you look at the other side, two wives of two prophets, Nuh and Lut, alayhim afdalu salatu wa atammu taslim. And the father is a prophet, yet the mother is a disbeliever. The son became a disbeliever. And the, father, the Quran records it. Oh, my son, come with us and don't be of those who are left behind. He says, I will go into the mountain. I will resist the punishment of Allah, Rabbul Izzah. So Allah destroyed him. Nuh alayhi salam says, Ya Rabb, he was my, from my family. And you promised the protection of my family. Allah, Rabbul Izzah says, he wasn't from your family. He was an unrighteous deed. Do you see the mother? My sisters, perhaps for some the time is too late, the children have already grown. I give you an advice, وَرَبُّ Kaaba from the depth of my heart. Bring up your children to become successful parents and successful upbringers of the next generation. Otherwise, the graveyards will become filled with Capacity in Jews that never reach their flourishing. Every single time in the Quran, where Allah tells us to make dua for our parents, where Allah tells us to be kind to our parents, where Allah tells us to be generous to our parents, He uses the word walidain. 
Meaning be good to your parents. Make dua for your parents. Be kind to your parents, but a little bit more for your, for your mother. Make extra dua for your mother. And the Prophet ﷺ summarizes this when the man comes to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, who's more deserving of my good companionship? Who did the Prophet say? To your mother. Okay, who's after that next in line? He said, to your mother. He said, thumma man, who's next in line? He said, to your mother. Then the fourth time he said, thumma man, who's next in line? And he said, to your father. Now why? Why is this extra special consideration being given to the mother? Two special reasons. Number one, when our mothers did the most for us, it's from a time, it's from a period in our life, in our existence that we have no recollection of. Difficulty upon difficulty. In the womb of the mother, do we have any recollection of that? And then even after the child is born, for two years that child is completely helpless. It's completely dependent in its existence upon its mother. She lives for this child. But what happens as we grow up? our needs start to become more and more associated with with our dads because we become more materialistic so the first time when you say I need a cell phone what does your mom say to you? go ask your dad go ask the big scary guy in the corner there so our needs because we we become materialistic our needs continue to become more and more associated with our fathers because it's based on money the mother it's like ah whatever Right? We take them for granted. Because we don't realize, we don't remember that our, literally we could not live without them. And very honestly, the second reason, it's because of the nature of mothers. I always tell people, mothers are the strangest of Allah's creation. They love so much and they, it's almost as if they want nothing in return. They don't care about themselves anymore. They live for their kids. You know, your mother will be, will be yelling at you and cooking your food at the same time. <laughs> Only a mother can do that. That's who mothers are. Little personal story. After my first daughter was born, she was about a, about a year old. You know, kids, they get sick. And the bug kind of goes around the house. So my wife is sick and my daughter was also not feeling well. So my wife is sitting there all night long, sitting next to my daughter, taking care of her, watching her. Won't leave her side. I'm telling her, listen, you're not feeling well either. You're sick as well. Why don't you take some medication, get some sleep? No, nope, I'm not moving from here. I'm not going anywhere. My child doesn't feel okay. I'm not going anywhere. And I was like, subhanAllah, mother's incapable of leaving her child. Father, be passed out somewhere. <laughs> Gone, clueless, right? Perfectly okay. Just won't leave. And that's when I'm just sitting there watching her. That she herself is so sick. But she just won't leave the side of the child because she's afraid the child is going to need something at any time. And that made me realize, I was like, SubhanAllah, look how much a mother loves her child. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of our mothers.